अखंडम सच्चिदानंदम अवांग मनसगोचरम आत्मानम अखिलाधारम आश्रय भीष्ट सिद्ध I take refuge in the self the indivisible the existence consciousness bliss absolute beyond the reach of words and thought the substratum of all for the attainment of my cherished desire I thought I've been chanting that every day but it's good to give the translation to So in the Vedanta sara which we have been studying we have been coming across the basic building blocks the basic definitions of advaita vedanta the system of advaita vedanta and now the question arises how does this entire universe come from brahman the ultimate reality the one how does it appear as the many so that's what we that's what we are going to talk about now we have started we know that brahman is now associated with maya and we were told that maya has two powers the power of veiling and the power of projection it's like the classic example of the rope and the snake there's a rope which exists really and then there is ignorance of the rope and that ignorance has two powers one is it hides the rope from us i'm ignorant of the rope it literally means i don't know it's a rope i know there's something there but i don't know it's a rope and the second power is it um it makes some it it makes me commit an error a mistake i think it's a snake or something else i don't see the rope as a rope i see it as a snake by mistake similarly brahman is the reality and then it is associated with maya which is this cosmic ignorance this maya has two powers one is the veiling power which means that i do not understand or realize what uh, brahman and the second is the projecting power uh, which makes me see or experience brahman as this world this uh, world of names and forms and bodies and minds samsara exactly like that now text number 54 विक्षेप शक्तिस्तु यथा रज्जज्ञान स्व आवृत रज्जो स्वशक्त्या सर्पादिकम उद्भावयति एवं अज्ञानमपि स्वावृतम आत्म स्वावृतात्मनि स्वशक्त्या आकाशादि प्रपंचम उद्भावयति तादृशम सामर्थ्यम तदुक्तम विक्षेप शक्तिर लिंगादि ब्रह्मांडांतम जगत सृजेत iti translation just as ignorance regarding a rope by its inherent power gives rise to the illusion of a snake etc in the rope covered by it so also ignorance by its own power creates in the self covered by it such phenomena as akasha etc such a power is called the power of projection it is thus said the power of projection creates all from the subtle bodies to the cosmos all right so what was said here for this to happen for this uh, you know um, projection of the universe to happen basically what needs to happen is that there must be a truth and there must be ignorance of that truth and then only there can be some falsehood so two things are necessary for something that is unreal or false to to appear two things are necessary there must be some truth there cannot be a false snake without a real rope you see the rope must exist otherwise there would be no no question of making a mistake there cannot be a false snake without a real rope that's one so there must be some reality there cannot be a world appearance without the ground of this world appearance which is brahman then the second thing which is necessary is Uh, ignorance of the rope if the rope is known as a rope then again there cannot be a false snake there cannot be an error about the snake so there must be ignorance about the rope there must be the rope there must be the ignorance about the rope and then only there is the possibility of mistaking the possibility of seeing a snake by mistake and as he says snake etc and that refers to the 
the original example where the friends were walking in, and in the semi-darkness, there's a rope there. They don't see the rope as a rope. Uh, they make mis different mistakes. One person thinks it's a snake. The other person thinks it's a flower garland discarded from a temple. The uh, third person thinks it's a crack in the earth, you know, caused by the last earthquake or something. Bhujhidra, Pushpamala, Sarpa. These are the different Vikalpa. That means various alternate errors. Falsity can be of many types. The truth can be one, but uh, lies can be many. Uh, there's one truth, which, which if it is hidden, people tell many kinds of lies. Uh, that beautiful statement that there's only one way of standing up straight, but there are many ways of falling down. Similarly, the truth is one, but falsity can be multiple. Errors can be multiple. Similarly, Brahman is the one reality, and that is hidden or the, the power of, of Maya to hide the truth. That is called Avarana Shakti, the veiling power. That is hidden from us. We do not know that, but we make a mistake about it. It is still there. There is something. And that something is now, because of our ignorance, the possibility of a mistake comes and we see it as samsara. The example of, of telling a lie. When is a lie possible? When can one tell a lie? Only when there is a truth. If there is no truth, there is no possibility of a lie also. So if there is no Brahman, there is no possibility of samsara. That's one. The second condition is that not only there must be truth, the truth must be unknown. If somebody knows the truth, you can't tell a lie. A lie won't stick. So the truth is there and the truth is unknown. Then only there's the possibility of misrepresenting the truth to telling it not. Uh, uh, not as it is, but as it is not. Um, similarly, there must be a reality and the reality must be unknown and then only there's a possibility of making a mistake about that reality. Now look at what was just said. Vikshepa Shakti Stu. So what is the projecting power? Earlier the veiling power was talked about. The veiling power which, uh, which prevents us from knowing Brahman as it is. Yatha, just like Rajyo Agyana Swabrita Rajyo, the, the ignorance about the rope um, projects the rope, Swabrita Rajyo, the, the rope which is hidden or covered by that ignorance. That rope, Swashaktiya, by its own power, whose own power? The power of that ignorance. The ignorance has a potency by its own power. Sarpadika Mudbhas Udbhavayati, it projects it, distorts it presents it uh, in a wrong way as snake, etc. Snake, um, discarded garland, um, crack on the earth or whatever. Evam, exactly in the same way. That was an example. Agyanam api, in that, in that same way, ignorance here. What ignorance are we talking about? The original ignorance of not knowing the reality. That ignorance, maya. Swa avrita atmani, the atman, the true self. Notice how it uh, flips between using Brahman and Atman at the same time. It means the same thing. Your reality, the ultimate reality of the universe is your reality. There's only one reality. That reality is hidden by ignorance. That's just a roundabout way, a fancy way of saying we do not know it. Then what happens? Swakshaktiya, by its own power, by its own capacity. Whose own capacity? The capacity or the power of ignorance, Maya. Akashadi prapancha mudbhavayati. It projects the entire universe, prapancha. What is the entire universe? Akashadi, space, etc. So we will see space is, uh, Brahman itself is misperceived, mis it appears as, as space and air and fire and water and earth and all the combinations thereof. All that's going to happen. The entire universe is going to come. Five cosmic elements. These are, and the entire universe made of the five. So prapancha, prakrishta rupe in a pancha. In Sanskrit, prapancha literally means that which is made out of five. What are the five? Pancha means five. What are the five? Space, uh, air, fire, water, earth. And we'll see how those elements come out. And then out of those five elements, the entire universe is created. That same Maya hides Brahman and projects Brahman as the five elements and the entire universe from, from made of the five elements. Everything is made of the elements projected by Maya. 
Now, just a little note here. Now we're going to talk about the construction or the projection of the entire universe, the universe which we are familiar with. It's important to know it is not a scientific project. Immediately our tendency, because we are in the age of science and um, we know so much about the universe now in so much detail, you will notice one thing. It's not science as we know it, as we moderns know it. And also the description of the universe seems one, rather sketchy. And number two, very anthropocentric, very human centric. The reason is this, they were not engaged in a scientific project. Let us not forget what is going on here. What is going on here? Adhyaropa apavada, superimposition, desuperimposition. It's a method of teaching Brahman. It's a method to attain enlightenment. That's all it is. For, from their perspective, we have tied us ourselves up in illusion, like the donkey which was, which was tied up by a, a non-existent rope. Now we have to, this, this complication has to be, uh, we have to be eased out of our illusion. That's all they're doing. They're not interested in developing science and technology. So it's not a serious attempt to understand the material universe. Second, you will see that the subtle body has five senses. So somebody might question, um, subtle body has five senses, why not? Other senses, there are animals which have other kinds of senses. Um, snakes have infrared vision, for example. Bats have echolocation with this, uh, like a sonar, you know. Uh, dolphins and uh, whales, they also have this, like a sonar they use. Multiple senses are there. Why only five senses? Um, the answer is, this whole thing is meant as a teaching device for us human beings, and that to human beings who are interested in enlightenment. So it has to describe us properly. It's, it's a very detailed description of ourselves, human beings. That is there, it's a pretty detailed description. And the more inner you go, physical body, just an overall description will be given. Subtle body, more detailed. Mind and intellect, and, and more and more detailed, more precise. You will see as it comes closer and closer to the self, the more precise and more careful it becomes. Uh, because the whole goal is to show that we are Brahman. Um, another example, we'll, we later on we will see life, when, it, when they talk about the coming of life, they'll talk about broadly four categories of living bodies. We might think only four. When we were school students, we studied, you know, detailed biology. Uh, we, I, we remember, you know, we all, we all studied it. Species and genera and phyla and, and so much detailed study of, of life and life forms. Where is all that? Just four categories. Remember, again, it's a, just a sketchy outline of the universe, just enough to serve us that you get a sense of familiarity. Okay, this is the universe they're talking about. And then the retreat will start. Again, the inward uh, movement towards realizing yourself as Brahman. So that's just a note I wanted to put out there. Um, it is not meant to be a description of a scientific description. Shankaracharya says that I mean, in one place in the Chandogya Upanishad, this question is raised. We're talking about five elements here. In Chandogya Upanishad, in one place, three elements are mentioned. Space and air are not mentioned. Just fire, water, and earth. So there is an interesting question raised. So the universe is made of five elements or three elements? And the answer given there is very interesting. See, that is not a pertinent question. Because we are not particularly interested in the actual scientific investigation of what the universe is made of. Then what are you doing? Why are you doing all this? And then the answer is given there that this is all a technique, upaya, a technique of directing our attention from where our attention is stuck in the universe. Taking our attention, turning it around towards ourselves, investigating ourselves and realizing that we are Brahman. That's the purpose of this entire exercise. So just to put it out there. Now what was said here, uh, the self which is covered, swa avrita atmani, swa shaktiya, by its own power, ignorance by its own power, projects five elements and the whole universe, prapancha, prapancha, um, made of the five elements. I'm sure I must have told you the joke about the prapancha komitadiya. No? I've told you, so I, I won't repeat that. Um, then he gives a quote from um, another Prakarana Granth. This actually we have read in Drik Drishya Viveka, this quote. Uh, he says, Vikshepa Shakti Lingadi Brahmanantam Jagat Srijit. 
the projecting power of Maya projects the entire universe from subtle body up to external universe. Linga deha. Linga deha means subtle body. From subtle body, starting with subtle body up to the external universe. Remember, what did he leave out? He left out the causal body and the ultimate reality, Brahman. Brahman is there. Causal body, that is Maya, is there. Now, from subtle body onwards up to the entire universe is, is projected by uh, the projecting power of Maya. Maya itself is the causal body. And beyond that is the reality, which is Brahman. Up to that, and so this is what we have done so far. Now, a question will arise in Indian philosophy. They talk about, so what is the cause of the universe? You're saying that Brahman is the cause of the universe or Maya is the cause of the universe. But technically speaking, two kinds of causes they talk about. Um, nimitta karana and upadana karana. So a potter makes a pot. So the potter is, the, is called the efficient cause or the intelligent cause, the nimitta karana, the reason, the, the one who makes the pot. But the potter needs some material to make the pot. And the material is the clay. So the potter uh, uses instruments, makes the clay into a pot. Now the question would be, here is this universe. Who or what is the intelligent cause or the, the efficient cause behind it, nimitta karana? And what is the material out of which the universe is made? And the answer will be that um, it is Brahman alone. There's only one thing which could be the cause, Brahman, uh, existence, consciousness, place, which is the material and the uh, efficient cause of the universe. Only remember one thing, the universe is not a real creation. It's more like a snake appearing in a rope, and more like a, a mirage, water appearing in a mirage not an actual creation, not that Brahman is transformed like clay into some kind of um, action is taking place in Brahman, no. Um, so Bra the answer will be, the question is, what is the nimitta karanam, the efficient cause, and what is pra the material cause, upadana karana? And the answer will be Brahman by itself is both the nimitta karanam and the material cause. Um, abhinna nimitta upadana karanam. The, the non-different, the one non-different, um, efficient and material cause of the universe is Brahman. Now, there are some details to be discussed here. 55. Shakti dvayavad agyana upahitam chaitanyam svapradhanataya nimittam svapadhi pradhanataya upadhanam cha bhavati. Consciousness associated with ignorance, possessed of these two powers, when considered from its own standpoint is the efficient cause and when considered from the standpoint of its upadhi or limitation is the material cause of the universe. Just one more text that I'll explain. 56. Yatha luta tantu karyam prati svapradhanataya nimittam svasharira pradhanataya upadhanam cha bhavati. Just as the spider, when considered from the standpoint of its own self, is the efficient cause of the web and when looked upon from the standpoint of its body is also the material cause of the web. So first he gives an example and this example is from the Mundaka Upanishad. The Upanishad itself gives the example. Example of what? How does the one become the many? How does your non-dual Brahman, no two, become the two and the many? Uh, how does the universe proceed from Brahman? So the example given in the Mundaka Upanishad is, uh, three examples are given, just as um, the spider projects the web from its own body, just as um, um, herbs and plants come out from the earth, just as hairs come out from, our, from a living body, so does the entire universe appear in the unchangeable Brahman. That's the original text of the Upanishad. Um, so beautiful poetry, just as um, Urnanabhi, Urnanabhi is spider. Uh, from it, from a spider, a web is spun. So does the universe. Uh, come from, from the imperishable Brahman. Just as um, plants 
and herbs come from the earth, so does the universe arise in Brahman. Just as hair, maybe even nails and all, they grow in a living body, so does this universe appear in Brahman. Why three examples? So you can think about it. One, three examples. One is the spider. The spider does two things. One is, it is a living being, a sentient being. So you can say that that sentient being, the living being called the spider, is the nimitta, the efficient cause of the web. It is spinning the web for its own purpose. That's one. Second is, it is what material does it use? Itself, its own body. Its own body. So the web comes out of its own body. Exactly like that, the intelligence, the consciousness behind this universe is Brahman. Remember, what Brahman are we talking about here? Brahman limited by or empowered by Maya. Brahman plus Maya. Not just the absolute reality Brahman. So Brahman plus Maya, which is, in other words, God. Saguna Brahman, Ishwara. That's what we are talking about here. So Saguna Brahman with Maya from its own perspective as consciousness is the one which projects the universe, just like the spider for its own purposes projects the web. So it is called the nimitta karanam, efficient cause. But just as the spider projects the web from its own body, Ishwara projects this universe from Ishwara's own maya or Brahman's own maya, the power. Just like the body of the spider, so is maya, the body, let's say within quotes, body of Ishwara. It is called the causal body. Karana Sharira. And it, pro it projects the universe. And the question may be that, uh, so the spider works really hard to make a web and we dust it and clean it off <laughs> every Sunday or something. But the poor spider works really hard to make a web. And uh, so does God have to work very hard to make this universe? No. Effortlessly, how plants and herbs come out of the earth Similarly, effortlessly does this universe arise in Brahman. And then, so is Brahman then, you know, like an in, insentient, like, like a force, like a, like a power, uh, like a brute, you know, like material thing like the earth? So no, this entire material universe arises from uh, a sentient being, just like hair, which arises from, um, the living body. So it's a living body. From our living bodies, something like hair arises. Similarly, from, from God, from Saguna Brahman, the entire universe arises. So three examples are given. There was this early European Indologist who reading this said that the ancient Hindus worshipped a gigantic spider. This is not true. It's Yatha. The word Yatha means just like. It's an example. Yatha means an example, just like the spider produces um, the web. So Brahman is both the material and the efficient cause of the universe. Remembering always, not really, don't take it seriously. Brahman has not done anything at all. If you ask the rope, so you are Mr. Rope, you are the material and efficient cause of the snake. The rope will say, what snake? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm just a rope. So if you ask Brahman, you are the material and efficient cause of the universe. No. What universe? I'm Brahman and I've always have been Brahman. So it's an appearance. And all this is an exp uh, a method to untie the donkey. Remember the donkey which was tied. So nothing whatsoever is happening. Now we can look at the text which we just read. Shakti, 55. Shakti dvayavad agyana upahitam chaitanyam. Chaitanyam, consciousness. What consciousness? The absolute reality? No. It is the absolute reality already conditioned, upahitam. Conditioned, associated by, limited with. Why, by what? Agyana. Ignorance. Here it means maya. And this maya has two powers. Shakti dvayavat. With two powers. Remember which two power? Projecting power, veiling power. Swapradhanataya. From its own perspective. Whose perspective? Perspective of consciousness. Nimittam is the efficient cause. So upadhi pradhanataya, from the perspective of its upadhi, I've already told you what an upadhi is. So what is the upadhi of God? Maya. From the perspective of Maya, upadhanam chabhavati is the material cause. So this is an important doctrine of Advaita Vedanta, that 
Brahman alone is the material cause and the efficient cause of the universe. And again, the fine print, not really, <laughs> because nothing has really happened. Um, Brahman is the efficient cause, uh, just like the spider is the efficient cause from the point of view of being a living creature. And Brahman is also the material cause from the point of view of uh, being uh, of, of Maya, just as the spider is the material cause, the point of view of its body, it causes, makes the web. Just like it makes the web, Brahman also makes the universe or projects the universe. Then 56, Yatha Luta. Urnanabhi is a uh, Sanskrit word for spider. Luta is another Sp Sanskrit word for spider. Tantukaryam Prati, um, with respect to the web. Karyam, it's an effect, it's a product of the spider itself. So Pradhanataya, from its own perspective, whose perspective? Spider's perspective. Nimittam is the efficient cause, intelligent cause. Swasharira Pradhanataya, from its bodily perspective, it is the material. What's the material of the web? Body of the spider. What's the intelligent or efficient cause behind the web? The spider itself. Similarly, what's the material of this universe? Maya. Everything is made of Maya. That's, this is where that borrowing from the Sankhya doctrine of three gunas, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas, this becomes useful. Because now Vedanta will say everything is made of three gunas or the entire universe, um, including the five elements which are going to be produced now. All right. Before we go ahead, let me just see what is the activity in the chat and questions too. Nirjari says, so they are saying science as we know it is part of the illusion. But this is a difficult question. They are not saying anything about science. I don't think they were talking about science the way we understand science today. But what would they say? What, do, what does an Advaitin say? Two views, let me give you. A radical view. A physicist once told me in India, he had gone to a great Advaita teacher at that time, one of the greatest living teachers at that time. And the teacher asked him, what do you do? And he said, I'm a physicist. Uh, and the teacher said, oh, physics, that's Maya. Forget all that and come to the Advaita, that's the reality. And the, the scientist was hurt when he heard this. So that's a radical view. And it's justifiable. From a pure Advaitic perspective, even science is so much superstition, let alone the rest of religion. Uh, religion, science, all our worldly activities, they are all products of Maya. They are all products of this projection. So that's one attitude towards science. But there's the other attitude towards science. Vivekananda, when he came here to the West, uh, he was very interested, not just when he was here, even before that, when he was in Calcutta, he would be always up to date with the latest. Today, if he were there, he would be reading all the latest papers, publications. Uh, he would be so happy with it. He said, knowledge is sacred. The greatest gift that we have is the human intellect and knowledge. And so every realm of knowledge, including science, is, is extremely important. It, that is also a manifestation of Brahman. So you can see it does two things. The same thing is the false snake, Maya, and its products. Or the same thing itself is the real rope, Brahman. So you can see it from the perspective of oneness, that whatever you see here is one with Brahman, including science. Or you can see it from the perspective of the falsity of the universe. Everything here is a projection. The ultimate reality is beyond words and concepts. So Vivekananda's attitude towards science was not only conciliatory, but also of appreciation. And uh, we, we know how he got along famously so well with Nikola Tesla, not the car, the scientist. So uh, he was, and Tesla was very impressed by Vivekananda. Um, then uh, William James and uh, uh, last year when I was at, at Harvard, I was speaking with Steven Pinker and uh, I told him that your office is in William James Hall and did you know of the connection between William James and Vivekananda? He was surprised, he didn't know that. Uh, so he was very interested to hear about that. Uh, then Edison, we have re records of Edison having long conversations with Swami Abhedanandaji and Abhidhanji visiting Edison's laboratory, and so on. So, um, Swami Ranganathanji in recent years was very interested in the latest developments of science, neuroscience in all these areas. And um, 
today from a Vedantic perspective, I find uh, the progress in consciousness studies of special interest to us in today's age. So yeah, so you can look at it both ways. Then Krishnamurti, Shekhar. I think it's totally acceptable to put forward a model of the universe. Even science can only describe a model of the universe as we don't really know in physics what the universe is really made of, despite how much we elevate our mo uh, model science. Correct, I agree totally. It is a model of the universe. You know, just as a short note here, when we talk about earth, fire, water, it seems very primitive. But remember, this was a common uh, uh, model across the ancient world, not just Vedanta. Every Indian philosophy sort of shared this idea. Um, the Chinese and the Greeks, uh, the ancient philosophers, they basically, they had this idea. And uh, you can see why. If you look around, what do you see? You see solid things and liquid things and uh, airy stuff. You see heat um, and you see space. You can see where the idea of space and air and fire and water and earth have come from. A more, more sophisticated idea was developed by the Vaisheshika philosophers, Nyaya Vaisheshika philosophers. They said, look at our experience of the world. When we as human beings experience the world, so we have these um, five senses and our sensory experience, it must be experience of something. So, um, so our sound, we hear sound. And so they thought that the basis of sound must be space. We now know it's actually not just space, it's air. So some medium is necessary for sound to uh, propagate, but they thought sound is, so sound means that there must be some element behind sound called space. We feel touch. So there must be some movement which is creating this touch. That movement they called air. We feel, we see form with our eyes. So there must be uh, something which gives visual forms and they called it radiance or fire. Um, then we have taste. So there must be something which produces that taste and they called it water. And then we have smell. So there must be something, some particles which produce, and that's actually how smell works <laughs> really. Um, so behind smell is the element earth. So they said the most primitive element, space has only one property, sound. Um, the next element, air has two properties, sound and touch. Uh, the next element, fire has three properties, sound, touch, and form. And then the next one, water has four properties, sound, touch, form, and taste. And finally, earth has all the five, five properties. It, it's, uh, you can hear it if you, you know, like tap it, you can hear the earth, earthy element. Uh, you can uh, uh, touch it, you can, uh, uh, you can see it, you can um, taste it, and you can smell it. So this was a whole model they developed based on, again, our experience of the universe. Not illogical, a pretty fine model actually, um, if you make it subjective from our perspective. A question would be, can these be mapped onto our modern physics? My answer to you is don't try. But it does not mean it has not been tried. Actually, pretty good minds had tried it. There was a scientist, John Dobson. Uh, he was an astrophysicist, an astronomer also. He popularized this, there was a movement in, uh, in Los Angeles called the Sidewalk Telescope to popularize astronomy among young people. He lived in our uh, Hollywood ashram for a long time, long before my time, so I never saw him. He was a disciple of Swami Ashokananda. And Swami Ashokananda had given him one uh, project that uh, what is the connection between the ancient cosmology of these five elements and modern physics? So he wrote, actually there are books published, I think, uh, by he tried. To me, uh, it doesn't seem very convincing. So uh, just take it as a model being used by these philosophers as a part, as a component of their overall project of superimposition and desuperimposition, a method of untying the donkey, that's all. Is Maya the material cause? Yes, Maya is the material cause. Um, Shravani, Brahman is both material efficient cause. What is the role of Maya in this universe? Or Maya is just a statement of fact to explain the model of the God. Right, Maya is the material cause. I'll just make a short statement here. Um, in what sense is Brahman the cause and in what sense is Maya the cause? So I'll make a distinction between 
vivartha karana and parinami karana vivartha karana means the ground of appearance the ground of appearance the rope is the cause of the snake not really it's the cause of the snake in so far as without the rope there would not be a snake the desert is the cause of the mirage water not really in so far as without the desert there would be no appearance of the mirage water there would be no mistake at all the sky colorless sky is the cause of the error of seeing a blue sky or the optical illusion of a blue sky not that the sky has become blue but it is without the sky it's the ground of that it's weird to call the sky the ground of <laughs> error but anyway similarly brahman is the uh, ground of the error of of the universe vivartha means apparent um, manifestation non transformative just as the rope without becoming a snake looks like a snake the desert without becoming watery looks like an uh, oasis the sky without becoming blue looks blue brahman without anything happening looks like the universe is experienced as the universe maya on the other hand is transformed into the universe so parinami karana means transformation cause that which is actually transformed milk is transformed into yogurt a seed is actually transformed into a seedling it sprouts so something which is a cause which transforms into its effect if the cause remains as a cause without actually transforming into an effect just looks like the effect it's called the vivartha karana vivartha means apparent manifestation or manifestation appearance brahman appears as the universe maya is transformed into the universe this is the difference so maya is the material cause of the universe maya is the material cause which is transformed into the universe it's just a fancy way of saying uh, just like our classical example of the rope and the snake the rope only appears as the snake at no point does the rope actually become anything like a snake whereas our ignorance of the rope is actually you can say it is transformed into a snake and an apparent snake it is our ignorance alone which is actually you can a kind of transformation takes place it is the cause real cause of our error okay is there anything else that i wanted to say here mm. Mara, remember this how is uh, is vivartha karana of of jagat of prapancha maya is parinami karana transformative cause now uh, here the huge amount of philosophy and theology has been done on this so for example um the difference between pantheism and panentheism so was spinoza a pantheist or a panentheist pantheism is that the world, god has become the world and that leads to a lot of a lot of problems if actually god has become tables and chairs of good and bad and evil god has actually become hitler that leads really leads lots of problems really um it's not much of a god then then god is gone whereas god appears as the world or god is reflected in the world or the world appears in god that is panentheism that is much closer to what spinoza actually meant and much closer to advaita vedanta a lot of lot of discussions about this okay then what caused nirguna brahman to become saguna brahman didn't become nothing caused nirguna brahman to become saguna brahman nirguna brahman is nirguna brahman the absolute remains absolute then what about saguna brahman it is nirguna brahman limited by maya if you, if you just said it has not been transformed not been limited true the limitation is also ap- apparent because maya is not a separate reality it's not something that actually does something to saguna brahman to nirguna brahman nirguna brahman of the absolute remains as the absolute the rest of it from Uh, saguna brahman from maya downwards is a matter of explaining it to us how the one appears as the many and why what is the point of all of this the point is to show us the way back to the absolute show us the way back to nirguna brahman to the realization that i am that all right shravani says five elements is generally accepted across hindu schools correct sankhya is the origin 
No, um, Sankhya is the origin for the Sattva Rajas Tamas. The five elements, I think, uh, they, in the Upanishads, it's mentioned. In the Taittiriya Upanishad. Did the sages use any method and mental instrument reducing? Yes, I just said how it was reduced into five elements. Mental instrument is our perceptions. From a human perspective, five kinds of perceptions. And the basis of these five kinds of perceptions. Sound, form, taste, touch, smell. The basis for these are the five elements. Kishore says, how does Maya affect Saguna Brahman? Is Saguna Brahman unaware of Nirguna Brahman? No. Maya does not affect Saguna Brahman. Maya is the power of Saguna Brahman. And is Saguna Brahman unaware of Nirguna Brahman? Not at all. Saguna Brahman is God, Ishwara, ever enlightened. So God always knows that God, that I am Brahman. Aham Brahmasmi is always true of God. We have to realize it, but God is ever realized. And the avatars of God are also realized that, um, that they are Brahman. So that's, that's always there. Their en enlightenment, their realization, the, the knowledge of the avatars and of God is never obscured by Maya. Okay. Uh, is Maya considered? There's a huge, huge question. Is Maya considered as real? No. So it's unreal. No. We studied it. Remember the definition, a so-called definition? Sad asad bhyam anirvachaniyam cannot be uh, expressed as absolutely real, cannot be expressed as absolutely unreal. You will say, uh, you are ever avoiding the question. Not at all. Actually, we, this is a category that we are used to in life. Tell me, what is fiction? Storybooks, movies, uh, theater. Is it really real? Do, do, do those things really happen? No. Is it nothing, completely non-existent? No, you'll say it's fiction. Correct. So Maya is that in-between category, which is not absolutely real like, the, like Nirguna Brahman, but it's not nothing also. It's not totally zero like, um, say, a square circle or the classic example of the sky flower or the Bandhyaputra and so on, the, and so on. Okay. Is there any relationship with Holy Spirit in Christianity and Maya? Difficult to say. I mean, uh, it, the Trinity concept and Vedanta, it's difficult. I wouldn't say that, really, because Christianity is basically, uh, it's either a dualistic religion or the closest it gets is to Vishishtadvaita. But Vishishtadvaita also, that's not correct. I can see a howl of protest across those who are traditional scholars. Uh, dualistic Vedanta is pretty close to um, Christian theology. Okay, let's quickly take a look at the questions. Okay, stop me if I'm getting this wrong. Uh, <laughs> but um, we say Brahman plus Maya gives rise to Ishwar, gives rise to God. And that sounds kind of sequential, um, or which makes it sound like they're at a most fundamental level, there is God doesn't exist. There's just Brahman, which has not yet interacted or used its Mayak power to give rise to God. Am I right so far? You're right. Except that the sequential model will uh, is good for explanations. So it's a good way of understanding it. Note note that really doesn't happen. Um, what it's like saying rope is real, accepted. We don't know the rope, accepted. And the next sequence will be the appearance of the, uh, the rope plus ignorance, which will produce the snake. But notice by this time, it has, we have moved from reality to appearance. Mm -hmm. So sequential, yes, but note that only Brahman remains real throughout and the rest of it is appearance. And then part of this whole thing is that, you know, I I'm always kind of amazed and awed by the, the, vast intelligence that's displayed in every bit of creation, however we look at it. And um, it just seems like um, almost sacrilegious or something, some to brush it off as non-existent or as just an illusion. It, it, it's an illusion, okay, because it's not what it appears to be, but I, I'm always awed by what a marvelous illusion. And, you know, the, the intelligence that is implied or that is revealed by the complexity of it all. And um, I'm not sure, I haven't quite turned this into a question yet, but perhaps you can see where I'm going with it. it there's, um, go ahead. If, if yeah. I might uh, yeah, yeah, uh, intervene here. 
so this is a a point that bill conrad who is here i think so he's a biophysicist uh, and so this is the point he keeps on uh, raising that yeah. there is enormous complexity in this universe whether you take life or physics he was talking about the recent discovery and confirmation of the uh, the gravitational waves but you know how is this a problem we are not saying that this complexity does not exist at the level of maya at the level at which we are experiencing the universe uh, this complexity is is there all scientific investigation uh, uh, you know uncovers it the more we are uncovering the more we are learning all of it is fine the dream analogy the snake rope analogy they're just that they're analogies all it is saying is suppose you want to take this as real this universe advaita actually has no problem with that advaita says yes this universe is real in the sense that you consider things to be real in that sense the universe is real in comparison to there is a deeper reality at uh, brahman uh, in comparison to which it, it begins to seem like a fiction that's what it's saying it's not a fiction like our movies it's not a fiction like our dreams it's not even a fiction like a snake in a rope it's not saying that brahman is a rope and the universe is a snake no uh, it is saying it's like that nothing in science tells us that there cannot be a deeper underlying reality yes what i'm getting at is that the the complexity and beauty of it seems to imbue it with a, a purpose a kind of a divine purpose and so the in light of that it seems like um on it, it seems that brushing it off as mere illusion negates the the fact that there does seem to be this this purpose oh but even illusion that could be could be a purpose in it um according to vedanta this entire universe is a creation projection of um, saguna brahman of god now at that level if you ask why would god project this is there a purpose behind it yes there is a purpose at that level there is god there are these entient beings like us who need a you know experiences who need a universe to go through to evolve and to come into realization of the absolute so there is an entire purpose to this the sankhya philosophy for example says that maya the prakriti nature projects the universe and it has a purpose and the purpose is twofold from a sankhya perspective one purpose is um, bhoga the other one is apavarga bhoga means experience apavarga means release so purpose remember purpose is always purpose for consciousness no um, absolutely material entity could ever have purpose see that's the way the, the whole clash between modern atheists and uh, non atheists are these are is there but uh, what scientists someone like richard dawkins or somebody else is they're trying to say is that there's really ultimately no purpose to this universe uh, there's no purpose or meaning to it except what you give uh, sean carroll one of the nicer voices among the new atheists for example will say no no there is meaning but the meaning is what you give to it so it stands there that the material universe has no purpose or meaning to it but meaning and purpose is there for us as sentient beings and sankhya says exactly that the material universe is there for two purposes one to give you the sentient beings experience all sorts of experiences life after life and finally to give you release freedom enlightenment release advaita vedanta has taken all of that this is yes god creates this universe projects this universe you are sentient beings in it and the whole thing is meant to make you go through a uh, life and ultimately the um, as you go through it progress enough you end up in vedanta sara class and so that's the whole purpose <laughs> of the uh, universe from god's pers- perspective except that advaita vedanta adds a wrinkle to it that even this purpose and all of that is still within the appearance nature because ultimately you are nirguna brahman you don't even need this purpose it is uh, it is all within the realm of appearance it seems like it's not just our purpose though it's some kind of cosmic or divine purpose and it it seems like ultimately it must is it it's it's strange to say well the whole purpose of this is to get out of it as soon as possible and to you know to kind of like m- merge back with the ocean as if it ever never happened um, there there seems to be is something gained by all this there's that ts eliot line about rediscovering the you know that from which we came and and discovering it for the first time you know that line right right um, something right. there seems to be a value added 
thing to that is true. going yeah. through this whole dance. You you journey and then um, ultimately you come back, not to see new things, but to see old things with new eyes. Uh, so I think it was from uh, Ulysses or something like that. There's this, uh, um, yeah. So take every bit of it as valuable. Advaita Vedanta is not against it. See, note, snake rope, dream, movie, these are examples. We're not saying our life right now is like, like a snake rope. Our life, Advaita Vedanta has multiple levels of reality. So there is this level of reality called Paramartika, which means absolute truth or ultimate truth, which is only Nirguna Brahman. Then there's the level of reality called Vevaharika, transactional reality, which is us, what we are doing right now. Religion, science, all of that. Universe, physical universe, and all the complexity of that. Art, all the beauty of that. That's relative reality. Below that is the level of uh, illusions, dreams, errors, snake rope, uh, dream, uh, mirage, all of that, which appears, but we know is not as real as this physical world. Now, Advaita Vedanta is not saying that this physical world we are experiencing is like a um, is, is equal to a snake mistakenly seen in a rope or a dream which is meant to be woken up from immediately. No, dream, snake and all are good examples to point out to the relationship between this world, which is as real as you want to make it. All that Advaita would want to say is that there is a deeper reality, there's a higher reality. I remember... Um, this gentleman is a mathematician at Oxford University. Uh, I met him at, all, of all places, at Shivananda Yoga Ashram in Bahamas. Um, I forget his name. Marcus, Marcus Dusatoy. He's the uh, professor of mathematics at Oxford. He's a, he's a successor to Richard Dawkins in a particular government post for, you know, for the promotion of um, scientific spirit in, uh, in the public. So he has taken the uh, exact opposite approach to religion from his predecessor. So Richard Dawkins was a militant atheist, uh, attacking religion all the time. Marcus says that his approach is conciliatory. He wants to understand the spirit of religion and explain the spirit of science to believing people. Anyhow, when we, we had discussions, we actually, I went to his house, he invited me for uh, dinner to his, uh, uh, his home in London when I visited England. So we had this discussion. He said, all of this, what you're talking about, does it invalidate science? The answer is no. Can you know new things? And are those things valid? Yes, you can know new and newer things about this world. Are those things valid? They are valid at, at the Vyavarika level, at the transactional level. Science is real and science works <clears throat> at that level. Advaita Vedanta has no contradiction at all with any scientific pursuit, with any artistic pursuit, or even religious pursuit. It makes all of it possible. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm like Bill Conrad. I'll keep chewing on this. But that's good that's, for now. That, that's right. Because it's, it's a um, common problem. Because the more you hear about snakes and ropes and mirages and dreams, you begin to see that that's what this world is then. No, they're not equivalent. Compared to the absolute reality, this is an appearance. That's all they're saying. Who else is uh, asking a question? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, Swamiji. I have uh, Actually, yes. two questions. One is that, uh, yes, last time you mentioned that you will point to the verse number uh, right, um, right. where uh, Vedanta Sara speaks about the intuitive uh, jump. And the other one is that uh, while all of this knowledge is, you know, extremely fascinating and, you know, interesting to learn and, uh, and absorb, but from the practical perspective, is, is it enough just to know and uh, understand and actually see in, in practice that everything is an object? I am not the object, that everything is thing as I am and just appears as object to me because that seems to be the quintessence of uh, Vedanta. Is could you, could knowledge you enough, that? actually? At that to, point, you, you broke up a uh, little bit. Uh, yes, so <clears throat> the question is that, uh, if I would take the quintessence of Vedanta, is that everything is an object. Yes. Whatever it is, like uh, I am the pure consciousness that observes and looks at it. All of the objects 
are, are actually me, consciousness, but it appears to me in different you know, shapes and forms and names. So is that knowledge enough to attain liberation? Or you need to actually go and study all of the details uh, about uh, various aspects of uh, Maya and how it all organized? Oh, so all the details are not necessary. The essential, um, the two-step breakthrough. First, you realize what uh, they're talking about when they talk about pure consciousness or pure being. And then you realize that is the only thing that exists. And then you might have a problem of, um, I sort of get it, but it's not real to me. Yeah, so that, or, that's where I am. Or, <laughs> yeah, it can be put in another way that uh, I have made the breakthrough, but I can't, I'm not stable in it. Mm -hmm. So realization and stabilization or understanding and then making it a living reality, that would be the thing to, to do next. Uh, so there, the role of Vedantic meditation uh, to the many ways of staying with that uh, understanding or realization until it, you can honestly say it's effortless. That's the whole purpose. All of this, uh, this equips you to study the original texts of uh, Vedanta, which are the Upanishads, which is where all this knowledge comes from, distilled from. Uh, it's good in a way. Uh, it, it helps you in the Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana process. This is the process. Basically, it's part of that. Right? Um, often we find that, all right, I've got the essence of it. But many of the doubts which come up later on, they wouldn't come up if we had uh, under if we had undergone a systematic study from the ground up, which is what we are doing here. So, do we need to read all the Vedanta books? Not at all, not at all. There are many books, like the huge books of dialectics, multiple objections and their answers to that. You, a spiritual seeker, need not go into that. If you're interested, it's there. But if you're not interested, it's fine. All you need is, say, for example. All you need is the Mandukya. And I'm saying that on the authority of Vedanta itself. Mandukya mekam evalam. Mandukya by itself is sufficient. Vimuktanam um, um, mumukshanam vimuktai. For those who seek liberation, to give them liberation, the Mandukya is enough by itself. One text at least, Mandukya is enough. Ashtavakra is enough. All right. The uh, text numbers you want are what is exactly enlightenment the details of it are there in this book from text number 172 text number 172 you have to jump ahead and read those things from 172 to 180 172 to 180 so the question which is dealt with is what exactly is enlightenment um, you say that the mind is necessary for enlightenment and then you say that the mind is it, enlightenment cannot be attained by the mind it is beyond the mind how can both be true so obviously in some sense the mind is necessary in some sense the mind is not necessary uh, so what exactly is going on here that's a discussion a very nice discussion but it needs explanation so you you can read it if you want to but uh, you have to wait Pranam Swamiji Yes, Punita ji. Uh, so I'm kind of building up, maybe repeating some of the things that were already said by Rick and um, maybe Bill has been saying it, but just coming from a purely scientific background, some of these things may sound very off the wallish, if you will. And you know that everything is coming out of this consciousness, there are no objects. But then uh, with your pointers, um, I'm just sort of laying it out and I want to see if you think I'm thinking along the right lines. So this whole um, point that Rishi Muni's actually had this as an experience, it's not just a book that's telling us so, it's not just a scientific theory, it's actually someone who had this experience, if you will, and they saw these things coming out, all these panchatattvas coming out of, um, you know, whatever, uh, the Chaitanya, if you will. But I just keep thinking, Swamiji, that, uh, of course, I have no experience of that sort, but I do go to sleep every night. And I know the world goes, disappears uh, every night for me, but I am there. There's something that is always there. And then I wake up and the whole world comes dancing right in front of me, including this class and all the interactions. And I repeat this every, every day. And I still kind of uh, doubt 
my own experience is it something that is that is maya that's telling me although i see it and i believe it and i have the you know the confidence that rishi muni is what they saw is true but then this science part of me which probably is part of this maya is again making me doubt go to another class read another book even though it's all very clear in a way uh, that defies all the books or the scientific explanations you know it's my own experience every night uh, why do i not believe that and hold on to it um, what's what's stopping me well neither blame science nor take the support of science science is not stopping you from enlightenment it is just our samskaras and we need um, the proper preparation where this will lead to that moment of enlightenment notice even after an enlightenment nothing will contradict science science operates at the vyavaharika level and all the findings of science are per- perfectly valid advaita has no conflict yeah advaita has a conflict when it when you leave, go from science to a materialistic reductionist world view that's a world view that's not something proven by science what i'm saying there's a big difference between a world view and the actual discoveries of science the actual discoveries of science nobody should doubt Uh, advaita has no contradiction with the actual discoveries of science but the world view which is a materialistic world view it says that this world of time space matter energy is the only reality this is the reality and your consciousness and whatever you're talking about must be a an afterthought um a subsequent byproduct of kind of organic matter uh, your brains and nervous systems that's it no that is where the problem is don't start with science when you are doing science do science but when trying to understand advaita vedanta don't start with science a very valuable instruction see this sadhus who wandering around in the mountain sides of uh, the himalayas such extraordinary insights we look stupid compared to them we modern people think i'll give you one insight think about it thunderous insight is um, sadhu he said जड़ से शुरू करोगे तो जड़ ही मिलेगा महात्मा जी चेतन से शुरू करोगे तो चेतन मिलेगा इफ यू स्टार्ट योर एनक्वायरीज फ्रॉम अ मेटीरियल ऑब्जेक्ट योर अल्टीमेट एनालिसिस विल लैंड यू अप इन अ मेटीरियल रियलिटी देर इज नो अदर वे यू विल बी फोर्स टू रिड्यूस सम हाउ कॉन्शियसनेस टू मेटीरियल रियलिटी ऑल्सो विच यू स्टार्ट विथ कॉन्शियसनेस यू विल एंड अप विथ कॉन्शियसनेस इज द अल्टीमेट रियलिटी स्टार्ट विथ अवेयरनेस स्टार्ट विथ माइंड एज स्टार्ट योर एनक्वायरी देर नोटिस when they are talking about the five elements where are they starting they are starting with our experience we see hear smell taste touch then what could be behind it the indian so the vaisheshika thinkers they thought about five elements but where are they starting they are starting with your own experience notice the scientific inquiry every inquiry has to start with you as the conscious inquirer is it not true who else is inquiring now it was you see we have to look at the scientific method itself it was found very soon that you need not keep saying that to the inquirer to the in- experimenter's consciousness these results are appearing because the experimenter's consciousness was com- was common to all of it so why keep on bringing the subject into it eliminate the subject be objective that's how science progresses but been doing that very soon it was forgotten that all this objective inquiry was being carried out by a subject this was forgotten completely and now when the inquiry is into the subject in consciousness studies that whole objective approach is now becoming like a ghost on our head you see the sheer ridiculousness i am studying consciousness consciousness studies yeah. and the immediate next step is so let me see how an octopus reacts to this kind of experiment you have conscious you are conscious are you unconscious why do you have to go to an octopus's consciousness it's like saying let me study life by first killing the animal and then we'll study life itself no <laughs> consciousness is the first fact if you want to study consciousness consciousness is available directly to you as conscious beings mind is available to you as mental beings anyway 
Um, so just one related point, Swamiji, on this. Um, so you mentioned uh, my sanskaras and vasanas, and I understand that part also, is that there is something deep inside in those impressions that probably is hindering some of this understanding when we are awake. When we are in deep sleep, those things also go to sleep. And that's why we kind of experience this oneness. And then when the manyness comes in the morning, uh, those sanskaras also come into the play. And I think there was a related question uh, probably in that uh, Rupert Spira discussion on the long path versus short path or whatever. Um, so is this something we need to distance ourselves during the waking hours from the samskaras and say that belongs no, to the no, jiva no. and Absolutely I'm the Chaitanya? Not. Absolutely not. No, 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 no. Remember, Advaita Vedanta is simple and direct. Don't mix it up with samskaras. Um, the only problem is ignorance. And the only solution is knowledge. That's what Vedanta has been telling us. You don't know, we are not aware of the reality underlying our experiences, which is consciousness or existence, Brahman. We don't know it. We don't see it. That's the only problem. When knowledge comes, when we realize it, when we make the breakthrough, the same samskaras may be there or may not be there. They won't be a problem anymore. You can still deal with them. Samskaras have to be dealt with by purifying the mind. That's a different process altogether. That, but that's not crucial. If you put the samskaras yeah, to that's sleep, what will I'm you, asking. if you put the samskaras to sleep, will you become enlightened? No. Can deep sleep make you enlightened? You see, the conditioning of the mind is what is keeping me in bondage. Not at all. Never. Neither the mind keeps you in bondage, nor the body keeps you in bondage. Only ignorance keeps you in bondage. After becoming enlightened, the same mind will still be there, the body will be there, but you realize everything as Brahman. Only ignorance of the gold nature makes us um, not know what the ornament is. The form of the ornament, whether it's a necklace or it is a bangle or it is a ring, it has nothing to do with the reality which is gold. All that you have to do is realize that it is gold. It can, bangle can still be a bangle, necklace can still be a necklace. By transforming a necklace into a bangle, you will not realize the truth. The truth is to be realized by knowing that it is gold. So whatever the form, whatever the samskaras, whatever is going on here, the reality has to be seen as, as, as Brahman. And that is done by an inquiry into our conscious experience. Not even believing in what the Rishi Munis have seen. Not necessary. You, Advaita brings us back to your conscious experience now. And step by step, Drik Drishya Viveka. Panchakosha um, Viveka, Avasthatra Viveka. It is not asking you to believe it. It's trying to show you something. There's a difference between telling us and showing us. These books tell us. And then the ultimate method is to show us what the reality is. The tenth man has to be shown that he is the tenth man. You counted the nine and then now there's a tenth man. So Advaita Vedanta is trying to do that. Start with conscious. Most important point I made in this whole science and um, uh, Vedanta debate. Start with the scientific worldview, you'll end up with materialism. At least the way science stands now. You'll end up with materialism. And if you are an honest and careful scientist, you'll end up with materialism with a big question mark. That we don't know enough yet. That will be the thing. Start with consciousness. Start with awareness. You'll end up with um, at least Sankhya, if not Advaita Vedanta. You might say, no, why will I start? There are two things, object and subject. Why will I start with the subject? Why will I not start with the object? The answer is very obvious. The object appears to the subject. You first, then you are samsara. You first, then you are science. How does science pr proceed? First, it makes an assumption. It, it brackets out. It cancels out. You, the observer, and then does science. Advaita asks, why? Why are you doing that? Why not first investigate you, the one investigator? And then you can do science after that. The point is, once you investigate the investigator, you will end up with the reality, which is existence consciousness place. Okay. Thank you. Um, you really run out of time. Anybody else is there? I think Shravani has a hand up. In the last class, I think you mentioned... Um, that the, when uh, in Vedanta Sara, individual uh, uh, or jiva refers to uh, the Prague, our deep sleep state, the Prague and not the, the glorious mind, body and all that. Did, did no, 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 no. 
That's the beginning of the jiva. See, we are just at the, at the root of everything. The root of the jiva is you in your deep sleep state. That's the most primitive form. Okay. Next will come you in your uh, dream state. Next will come you in your physical, material existence as Shravani. Okay. So up to that, um, we are, this will continue. What is this? This is called Adhyaropa, superimposition. Mm-hmm. Superimposition has just started. From the ultimate reality, we have now imposed the, um, the Ajnana, ignorance. And that is called the causal body. So the uh, ultimate reality, Brahman, plus this individual ignorance is Pragya, the, the beginning of the Jiva. The you in your most elementary state, which is us, like what we experience in deep sleep. Okay, so it was just telling about the seed form of the Jiva. The yeah, the beginning of the Jiva. The beginning of the Jiva. Uh, um, there is a, a, the other question. I think in one of the previous uh, classes uh, we discussed that Pragya is an Ishwara at the same and is is described as bright, very bright, and all that. Like it, it's almost a state. But is it only something that we um, like this equivalence between Ishwara and uh, like Pragya, like the individual? Does it happen only in the uh, like? deep sleep state which is something beyond our control or is there something that we can approach consciously through meditation I mean, yes i guess in the mystical um, experience you can experience can deliberately experience a oneness with ishvara as a jiva retaining your jivahood you can experience a oneness oneness with ishvara through a mystical experience but that on, that that will have a beginning that will have an end we are not god we may feel a oneness of, with god through practices but Advaita Vedanta is not interested in these things. Advaita Vedanta says, what is prior to God? What is prior to you as Jiva? That's what Advaita is interested in. So this is where I'm experiencing Maya and uh, like the very root of Maya, like the very yes. beginning. So when we pra- if we practice Vedantic med- meditation, does it, uh, does it take in that route or not at all? When you consciously just discriminate that I'm the uh, like I'm the co- uh, conscious observer witness, so do we at all uh, uh, feel that state of pra- like similar to the deep sleep state at all? Like when I'm just uh, it, 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 there are no activities of the mind at all. Do we reach such a state? It could be. One can reach that. That will be if we consciously reach that. That will be nirvikalpa samadhi. But even that is not something Vedanta is interested in. So Vedanta says that you are the Turiya witness of the three states. Mm-hmm. I'll just leave, leave you with this interesting uh, um, point to think about. Advaita, non-dual. Non-dual knowledge and non-dual experience. Our experience of the world in the waking state is dualistic. I am the subject and I experience a multifaceted reality. Our experience in dream state is dualistic. I experience multiplicity in dreams. Many things, many people, many things are going on, change. But my experience in deep sleep, if you can call it an experience, is non-dualistic. There is no experience or an experience, let alone the differentiation of the experienced objects. No differentiation of experienced objects. In fact, no differentiation of experiencer and experienced also. No subject-object differentiation. Multiplicity of objects is not experienced and the subject-object duality is also not experienced. So you can call deep sleep an experience of of non-duality, an experience of non-duality, which we all have. It doesn't help us. I mean, it's very refreshing to go into that and come out of it, but it does not help us spiritually at all. Mm-hmm. Advaita is not interested in that. Advaita is interested in Turiya, the fourth, not the waker who is experiencing plurality, not the dreamer who is experiencing plurality, not the deep sleeper who is experiencing non duality, but rather the fourth who is the witness of the first three, to whom the waking, dreaming, and deep sleep appear and disappear, to whom plurality appears and disappears, to whom non-duality appears and disappears. That one is the true non-dual state. Mm -hmm. Not state. That one is the true non-dual reality. Uh, Deep sleep is a non-dual state which comes and goes. And that is, um, it's a state. It's not the reality. The reality is the fourth, the Turiya. And that's what you are actually. 
that's what advaita wants to point so when you are um, advaita would say you are non dual in waking also even while experiencing duality you are still non dual so that's uh, the nirvikalpa samadhi state that uh, that's not the same as surya no 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 not at all what's the difference i used to think that yeah that... nirvikalpa samadhi is asampragyata samadhi of yoga chitta vritti nirodha where uh, all the modifications of the mind are um, suppressed and so the consciousness remains as a witness of the suppressed mind or the controlled mind okay and that is helpful in the yoga system for generating what is called viveka khyati the knowledge that i am separate from nature look everything is stopped i do not see a world i do not see the body i do not even see the mind i do not even see the intellect i do not even think and it's clear that i exist now that clarity as an experience not just thinking about it that comes to asampragyata samadhi that is the yogic path that's not what advaita is talking about mm-hmm. advaita says instead of going through that exercise right here sitting here looking at your um, screen and the world around experiencing the body can you see yourself as the non dual reality which is the only thing which is there here actually not by changing experiences bhakti is the path of belief faith god will help us through yoga is the path of new experiences mystical experiences extraordinary experiences advaita is the path of knowledge taking up ordinary experiences not extraordinary yogic experience not the faith of bhakti rather an investigation into your experience here and now revealing the truth if advaita is the truth if non dual brahman is the truth it must be here right now it must be here right now okay we have got really one run out of time but there's something i must tell you i was avoiding it so i'll just um tell this to you and then we'll stop so a tibetan buddhist teacher who i have been in dialogue with on and up so he wrote to me recently he gave some core teachings of um, you know it's called rigpa the final awakening uh, practices in tibetan buddhism and uh, he said can i substitute brahman for buddha nature here so the last line the last line was that um, w- what is uh, let me just read out from his email um his email was yes one second ha huh? he said can we substitute brahman for buddha nature in the last paragraph in the last paragraph was listen to this this is from a tibetan pers- buddhist perspective what is consciousness consciousness is buddha nature what is buddha nature colors forms shapes sounds flavors odors sensations emotions thoughts and self identities so can we say that this is brahman and i wrote back to him i will modify it slightly what is consciousness consciousness is brahman correct what is brahman i said that which is experienced as colors forms shapes sounds etc what he had said was what is buddha nature colors forms shapes sounds uh, so on what i said was that which is experienced as colors forms shapes sounds flavors etc is brahman brahman in itself is not colors sounds and shapes and forms okay now then i thought more deeply about it both the tibetan path and the advaitic path are upayas and methods pointing to a realization now there are advantages of the tibetan buddhist path and there are advantages and disadvantages of the advaitic path what is the disadvantage of that buddhist path from an advaitic perspective why did i why did i hesitate to say buddha nature is colors flavors and all? because the moment you say this is buddha nature this is it 
what you are hearing smelling tasting touching your samsara um, you know love hate sorrows old age covid dying all of that is this is buddha nature that's it the immediate reaction will be what then why even call it buddha nature this is samsara this is life this is suffering and um, you know dying and uh, misery uh, then what is the point of it all so that could be a mistake that could be the problem from that uh, from that approach the advaitic ad- approach has the advantage of telling you that this is an appearance investigate this color sound shapes thoughts and feelings you will find brahman the, the consciousness as such so this is a, the instinctive reaction of an advaitic um, student now what is the advantage of the buddhist approach and the disadvantage of the advaitic approach the disadvantage struck me i was just walking in the park and suddenly struck me the disadvantage is this the moment you say that brahman is that which is experienced as this which is being experienced as samsara you have created a slight gap between appearance and reality and that's useful when we are ignorant but it becomes an obstacle when you are on the verge of enlightenment because you are probing your experience to find brahman but when you make the breakthrough this is an important insight when you make the breakthrough it is actually true literally true colors flavors sounds smell taste uh, touch thoughts emotions ideas um, waking dreaming deep sleep this is brahman once you make the breakthrough it is like saying so the necklace and the bangle and the uh, ring that's gold and if you want to say that no 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 gold is that which is being you are seeing as necklace bangle and that is the reality of those things that's good to point out gold once you have known what is gold for you you know what is gold so when you see a necklace do you not see gold exactly do you have to make any further analysis no it is gold only similarly for the enlightened person literally there's nothing further to be done no need to further say that brahman is that which is being experienced as this this is brahman sarvam khalvidam brahma it has to be uh, treated with with care uh-huh. all right thank you so much we'll deal with the rest in the next class om shanti 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 hari om tat sat shri ram krishna rupa namastu